Hello everyone and welcome to Now and Zen. On today's episode we have Vivian Tylinska, a uh, metal extraordinaire, proud owner of two 17 and 22 tone guitars, a uh, viral Twitter legend. Hello Vivian, how are you today? Hello, thank you. I'm, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on here. I have more than two 17 tone guitars. I have like five. You've got five? No, I own three. I have given away or sold three more, I think. I've made many. I own three. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> I love it. I like how you had even more microphone guitars than I thought you did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, right beside me, I have what? the Pichon <laughs> bass. Oh my god, that is such a great looking bass, the, just with the five yeah. strings there. And that extra I, of little uh, tuner that is popping out the side is so funny. Oh yeah, this, this headstock. Um, yeah, this, this bass is just like, it's very pretty. Um, yes. I got a very similar, I, I didn't get this with the intention of refretting it to 17 because I had a 17 bass. That was, I think, my second ever um, refret, but it was garbage and it looked like garbage. Um, ah. <laughs> so I got my hands on um, a Fender Jazz Bass five string that I thought was even prettier. So I was like, okay, I'll put this other bass under the knife and have a proper five string. I had to play my super low tuned, low tuned metal with, yes. um, and I have this other seventeen tone guitar, which I might sell. I don't know. Um, I have my twenty two bass downstairs. I have. I tried counting all the guitars I've refretted. I think it's at like twenty two or twenty three at this point. I've done a lot. Oh my god, that's so much. That's amazing. Well, you were talking about how. You made a 17-tone bass for, for Adam Neely. What's up with That's that? Right. That's right. Um, well, I had posted this video to Twitter um, a couple months back that kind of blew up. Um, and it was just me playing some like metal riffs on my one of my first 17 tech guitars. And Adam Neely retweeted it and yes. messaged me and said, how much for um, a 17 Ted bass snack? And I was like, oh my gosh, um, Adam Neely, you know, one of the, the, the more popular proponents of microtonal music is, is asking me for a, a microtonal neck. So I, I made him one. Um, he sent me a, a brand new bass that he ordered. Um, I took off the fretboard, I built a new one, um, and I sent it to him like a, a few months ago and he did a little unboxing video um he's gonna i think eventually make a video with it i assume he's probably just like still <laughs> getting to know how to play it i think he has much more um sort of ingrained uh you know music theory he has much more of a sense of like oh you know a, a tonal system that he uses when when playing because he's like a an actual professional jazz musician Oh, yeah. um, that I don't necessarily have as someone who's not like a, a trained musician. It might also be that the 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 fretboard was a little um, not uneven, but I, I think he said that he wanted the action like adjusted to a really like specific amount. Um, but yeah, that was really wild that I got to see like a big YouTuber like open up a bass that I had that I had made and 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 play on it, and yeah. it sounded really cool uh, when he was playing it. Yeah, I guess I didn't see this, like, unboxing video. Was it something it was, he had on his channel for a little bit and took it off? Or? It was just on his Twitch. I didn't uh, know about it until he sent it uh, to me. I don't think it was, like, it wasn't, as, it wasn't like, a big official video. It was just, like, a, a couple-hour, like, live stream. Uh, yeah, I didn't know he even uh, had a Twitch account. Really exciting when somebody really, um, like, super, super popular gets into microtonality in a way that's not just using quarter tones. Because I feel like getting into quarter tones is so much easier than getting into, like, lots of other systems that use, like, weird numbers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, especially because um, in the case of anyone who's, like, a guitarist um, or bassist, you have to have, like, a custom instrument. Um, yeah. You know, I guess you can kind of get by with quarter tones on a regular 12-tone guitar by, like, cross-tuning. And there's, like, you made that video about, like, making a, a guitar, like, in 11 or 10 by creating a little false bridge. Um, 
I remember um, I had this banjo and I realized it just had kind of like a floating bridge and then I could just move it up and down and I uh, tried playing it in 11 and in 10 and that was really fun. Yeah. How did that work was, out like tuning wise? Like intonation wise? Yeah. Did you feel like were you satisfied with the scales that you were playing or were you like, oh, that note's a bit too high, that note's a bit too um, low? Well, I don't think I have that developed of an ear to be able to really discern. Um, when I was playing it in 10, I was uh, playing a lot in the kind of pentatonic thing. That wasn't something that I like spent a lot of time on. It's something I just like futzed around with one day um, for fun. Uh, I had this idea that I could... Um, I had a 22 guitar at the time, and I thought that I could do a little cross-tuning thing um, where I had the bridge moved over to 11 tet on the on the banjo and then play some stuff on the guitar, but I never got around to it. I still haven't written anything in 22. It's, it's such a cool and interesting tuning, but it's still a little too mystifying. There's still too many notes for me. Yeah, yeah. I completely understand. I mean, that's how, that's how I feel about 22, actually, as well. Yeah, it's, it's so cool um, when people can play in sort of higher tunings. I'm really just used to a couple of the, of the, of the smaller ones, but uh, 22 really has so much cool potential. And, you know, in that sense, I think I'm also like limited by the, the, the physical characteristics of a guitar. When the notes get too close together, it gets really hard to play. Like 22 is already at the high end of, of what I'm able to to manage with my with my fingers yeah yeah absolutely so then what would you say you you look for in a tuning because like you've got 17 and and you've got 22 um what what about those particular tunings stands out to you 17 was the first one that i started with um a little over two years back um i wanted something that had um the fifths, the the pretty solid perfect fifths, um, mm -hmm. you know, because I play a lot of metal and that uses a lot of uh, the fifths. So having that intact meant I could still play power chords and keep a lot of things the same. Um, and I've just kind of at this point gotten so used to 17. Um, and in a way you can play 12-ish sounding and like feeling stuff on a 17 guitar and I think that's kind of what I've ended up doing I I, I don't know if I've really like internalized um like a more zen approach to 17 I think I might have just kind of carried my sort of like move some shapes around over the fretboard uh stuff from 12 over to 17 uh which lends itself well to some of the chromatic stuff because like you know, you go a couple steps and there's this noticeable, like, oh, like, it's, you've gone, like, down four steps, but it's, like, the, the space is a little bit smaller. Um, yeah. yeah. Same time, you can have, like, very similar feeling resolutions in 17. Um, and that's something that I definitely like about it. Um, for the purposes of my music, I'm not really thinking about, like, the theory of it. I'm not really thinking about the intervals um and i really like 17 because you can just you can play stuff that sounds almost regular that sounds almost convincingly like not microtonal it's just like a little bit um like destabilized like a little a little crunchier sounding um and that was i guess my initial idea for this album that i'm writing yes i think that was just like using um 17's ability to just sound like even darker like to make these like small you know minor seconds just like this the slightest bit like more dark sounding to make the the, the minor thirds just a little more a little more like shallow and, and and sad i guess and then you know on on, on the other hand the, the the major thirds just sound like a little extra bright and just like a little I don't know, not, not, not saccharine, but a little, like, astringent, maybe. Yeah, like, uncomfortably so, in, in 17 Yeah, it's like, too, it's, like, too major sounding, you know? Yeah. I think you really used that in great effect, uh, in, in some of the songs you sent me. Uh, you sent me a few, um, demos of this, uh, upcoming album of yours. Is that album going to be entirely in 17 Tet? Yes, it is, um, it's on 17 Tet, um, 
it's all written for the most part. I'm currently working on just like learning to be able to play it. I think especially on the drums. Um, I think there's not like a big focus on the microtonality aspect of it. I don't I don't feel like I lay into um, it as, as much as like the Mercury Tree does. Um, I think also having just a ton of dissonance kind of hides a lot of the, the, the subtleties of it maybe, or makes it sound less like distinctly out of tune when it has mm. all that high upper uh, harmonics from the distortion and stuff. Dissonances, uh, you think kind of mask, um, mask, the, mask the subtlety you'd say of 17 tet. Yeah, the, the distortion, um, you know, like writing metal that uses like very, very heavy distortion and also super low tunings. Um, I think 17 in particular, because it has that perfect fifth um, and it's got like two tritones kind of. Um, I mean, two of the main chords that I, that I use just in writing this kind of like death metal-y stuff is you know the power chord and um like the power chord but with a diminished fifth or i guess an yeah. augmented chord um and those two chords i use very very prominently and it's cool because you have like you know this 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 tritone of like two different two different flavors um you can have this extra sharp tritone or that kind of flat uh 11th harmonic tritone which um, you know, with the distortion, you don't really hear it as, like, a harmonic, necessarily. You just kind of hear it as a detuned, um, a detuned tritone, I guess. I noticed you uh, toying with that in the demos. Do you, um, ever go back and forth between the two tritones, and do you find one to generally be more dissonant than the other? Yeah, um, there's, um, there's a few segments in, um, number as iron device where I use I use the, sh the sharper one and then the flat one. Oh, I see. And then sometimes even with a, a flattened seventh or a flattened octave. Yeah, it yeah. It sounds so weird without the without the distortion. Hold on. Kind of like that. Man, I love it. And, and so you're taking that, like the shape that you have with your hand. You're kind of uh, treating a lot of those chords then, sort of like power chords, where you shift it up, but maybe you change something small in the voicing so that you get a different quality of interval. Yeah, um, and I guess in, in, in the other part of that song, I have, like... And then I kind of turned that around. Or no, that second part I think I cut from the song, but I have a lot of kind of... Going back and forth between kind of the smaller and the bigger. Uh, smaller and bigger tritone. It's unsettling, uh, and it fits so well with the style. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the like, mixing, it hasn't been mixed yet, um, and the drums are programmed so far. Um, I haven't gotten around to learning all the drum parts yet, um, and there's no vocals, so it's really missing the kind of, like, gritty aspect that I think will kind of put it all together, but for now I'm just focusing on, like, just on the notes and the relationships between the notes before I get the the the, the tones and, and everything put together. Yeah. Are you planning to um, put in vocals then in that album or is it gonna be all uh, non-vocal? It's gonna be, it's gonna have vocals. Um, it's gonna be screamed vocals because I can't sing. Um, that's kind of the main reason that I tend towards metal because I'm completely uh, unable to carry a tune I think being able to sing um, microtonal stuff is also like exceptionally hard. Um, I'm very impressed by anyone who can do it. I think it's it's very cool, and it also sounds like extra strange because with the voice, mm. especially, 
I think yeah. you're expecting to hear something in 12. So like when you hear someone singing a microtonal melody, it sounds extra, extra microtonal, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's just gonna be, it's just gonna be screaming. Um, the, the, I don't know, I like to bury the vocals. I don't like to put them front and center. I'm a little self-conscious about them. Um, but if I could sing, if I could sing, I think it'd be very cool to have um, like microtonal, like harmonized sung vocals kind of, maybe not with this music, but with something else. Well, hey, I, um, I, I sing a lot and I'd love to um, sing in any of your projects. Um, I think that would be- Yeah, that would, would be really would awesome. Me. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I've, I've had this idea of making, I guess, I mean, um, Brandon's already done this, uh, making kind of like dream pop in 22. Yeah. With Elevens. I also, I just listened to his newest record. Um, Realism? Yeah, it's really incredible. Yeah, it's great. I guess I haven't been as tapped into um, like the microtonal community. I think Facebook seems to be where all of that is. And I have just haven't been using Facebook at all in the last, basically all of this year. So I feel a little detached from that, um, which is kind of a bummer. Um, honestly, that's only that's one of the only reasons I would be using Facebook at all. Um, right, that's just, the only reason I use it. <laughs> yeah, um, Twitter, where I guess I, I'm most active, um, doesn't seem to have that that kind of microtunnel um, community. But I guess the format of it doesn't isn't isn't as suitable, um, right? Because you know these like you know small things being said very quickly, as opposed to like people posting on like a board right yeah exactly i don't even know how to how to use twitter for the kind of conversations you have on facebook i gather that like people do like twitter chats sometimes like just for fun like i've been in some like composer chats where people are like hey you want to chat about the state of new music composition and all that um so that's the closest that i've ever seen to something like that on twitter um for sure I'm definitely, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to promote microtonal music as, as best I can on Twitter. Um, you know, just very recently this year, I've gained like a, like a following on Twitter. It's really strange going from like, like having a couple hundred people seeing my tweets to having like 12,000 people. People really like to see um, people play uh, metal guitar in like vintage outfits. Turns out that's, people like it. Um, I think that's, yeah, there's something about, like, the novelty of that that I think is uh, slightly amusing and provo provocative in, like, just the right way for the internet. Yeah, it's definitely, um, it's a bit of an untapped market, so I'm trying to corner that. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be posting more about microtonal stuff. I want to maybe, like, talk more about, because, like, I've kind of strayed away a little bit from the theory um, at least relative to how, like, a year or two ago, I was, like, really diving deep and, like, reading a lot and, like, going into a lot of the math of, of, of the music. Um, right now, I've just kind of, like, kind of, um, like, internalized the physicality of playing the microtonal guitar, at least. So I kind of, I've gotten so used to playing in, in, in 17 on these guitars that I have that it's, it's like weird going back to a twelve tone guitar at this point. Like it sounds like it sounds different and wrong almost. Um, yeah. Like my fingers just go to the wrong to the wrong places. So I've just kind of gotten used to to how it to how it plays, <laughs> which is fun. You think you and the Mercury Tree will ever like pl play a show together or something with the seventeen tone guitars you have after COVID is over and everything? Maybe in twenty twenty three. Yeah. No, okay. I would love to. Um, a I, I really would love to be playing some of my music live. Um, I just need to find some musicians who are willing to learn these like 15 minute long songs with 20 parts. You know, I'm sure <laughs> someone's yeah. out there. I just need uh, someone who's willing to, to believe in the vision, I guess. And at the same time, someone who's willing to probably learn how to play microtonal guitar, um, which is a bit, it's a bit of an ask for someone like, just posting like, hey, I want someone to play my music that I'm writing. You gotta, it's microtone, you gotta <laughs> learn a different instrument. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm, 
used to wanting to have a lot of creative control in a project. So I forget there are people who want to join a band and just like play the instruments and play someone else's songs rather than want like a say in what the music is and how it's written. Yeah, and it's like the people who want to play complex stuff, I feel like they usually are the creative types who want to say in the writing generally. Yeah, and that's, you know, maybe ideally like in the situation I wouldn't even be in the band. I just want to like write the music and then not have to deal with the the technical (laughs) aspects of being able to perform it. Because the music I write is always harder than like where my technical skill is at. So I have to spend a bunch of time like building up my skills to be able to play the music that I've written, which is annoying and it makes it hard to make music. in the demo there's uh, there's a certain rhythm in there and i'm wondering if it has a name i'm exposing myself as like somebody who's not well versed in like all metal tropes and all that stuff but it's it's a thing where like you've got a polyrhythm going in the drums and the guitar but the drums are like going at a constant rate it's a very distinctive kind of rhythm i think like jute guy also uses it it's not in the mercury trees uh album at all um it's kind of like where you're playing along and you've got actually it's like you've got a riff and the riff is going and then all of a sudden the drums come in like <laughs> and it's clearly like not on the meter of the music but it's all like lining up in polymeters somehow like blast beats oh but that's it yeah maybe yeah where it's it's just like a very 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 fast alternating between like some symbol and the the snare like i think so yeah yeah the like not the downbeat but it's usually like 16ths um and it's like eighths on the the quarter notes on the eighth notes um on 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 whatever symbol and then um the snare every other um every other 16th note i think is that what you're talking about just like it's just very fast and just, i think like, so a, yeah all the sound yeah um yeah that's um that's something that's found in a lot of metal, uh, very common in, in um, black metal and in death metal. It's, I've been working on my drumming a lot. I mean, honestly, much more than on my guitar or piano. I'm practicing drums to be able to, to play that well. I think part of like what might be off might also just be that my guitar playing is a little bit off. Sometimes it is, I'm not the best guitar player. Um, I was listening to this interview with Jude Guy actually um, with Charlie Looker, and it was really cool because he was talking about how he like doesn't consider himself like a very um, like technically skilled um, like guitarist in the in the usual way where he can do a bunch of stuff. He's more just like learned how to do his own kind of music and like use guitar to his own ends and i feel kind of the same way um i wouldn't consider myself a skilled guitarist i can't uh improvise very well i can't i i can't play scales fast i can't play fast in general um i can just tremolo peck and that's about it hey well that's all you need for metal yep and yeah, it's it's true i mean some 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 metal guys are all about the fast solos and i have no solos because i don't want it and I also can't do it. Improvising in microtones seems seems really hard. When the Mercury 2 was over at my parents' house when they like did their world tour, they like took some of their 17 songs and they just like started playing them on my 19 tet guitar. Oh, oh wow. now that was so mind warping because they like it, it's like I think the way they were playing it was just like if you were counting the 17 frets but just like in 19 space so everything was just like shrunk. So it was very oh god. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think like when people I don't know, all the times that I've had people like try out my microtonal instruments um they kind of like play as though it were a like a 12 instrument so they just kind of play like everything like scrunched together. So, right. you know, like two frets apart what would normally be your um your perfect fifth. They play um you know, the, the diminished fifth instead. Right. And I don't know, I mean, because people are so used to like certain chord shapes. Um, and likewise, when I, w- going back to my um, my 12 guitar, I, you know, I like 
when to play a, a, a power chord, but instead I played, you know, one fret too high because my brain is so used to like, you know, you have three, three numbers apart. Um, right. I'm so used to, like, I don't think about, like, when I'm writing music, I don't think about notes. I think about numbers. I just think about, like, the fret numbers um, yeah. and, like, yeah. how many frets apart is, is, this, is this chord. Like, I know, you know, like, neutral, minor, major, but I'm not thinking about that as, as, as much. Um, I'm just like, it's, it's three apart. The chord is, it's three. Yeah. What? Yeah. There is this joke somewhere that, um, some metal guitarist is like, what, uh, someone's like, what, what key is this song in? And the metal guitarist says three. <laughs> that's good. That's, I mean, that's, that's how it is. Yeah. Though. I think, you know, like West, like n- music notation for the way that I think of music, which is just like sort of sh- shapes going up and down on a fretboard, because that's the easiest way to write for me. Um, you know, it's different on a piano, but n- notation makes th- that, you know, a simple idea. Like you play this shape here and then you go down three frets and you do the same kind of shape. It makes it feel like much more complicated than what it is. Like it's oh, helpful yeah. in intuiting like what it might um, kind of approximate in like a, a tonal framework, but I think I I don't necessarily use. That. I wouldn't say my music is atonal. Um, it's kind of halfway between atonal and tonal. It's sort of maybe accidentally tonal and accidentally atonal. Yes, and I think. Uh, Using 17 and just like writing microtonal stuff in general um, makes it easier for me in that sense because I don't have to to justify my like uses of having this chord here, having this chord here because it's it, it all sounds foreign. It's all gonna sound um, foreign, and I'm you know I'm thinking more about the rhythms maybe than um, like melody and harmony in any way. Yeah. So having the kind of novelty of microtonal stuff like puts that weight off of my shoulder so I don't have to come up with something totally new and original or something that doesn't sound like something else. It's yeah. it's all gonna sound like like something that people haven't really heard unless they're already very versed in microtonal music. Right. It's like the microtonality is freeing in that way. Cause you know Right, exactly. Um it also, you know, a lot of people have talked about how microtonal music is kind of like giving them just more colors to work with, you know, more than just 12. Um, you know, in this like 24 just has like the extra step in between, just this extra shade. Um, and I think 17 really does a lot of that for me because I don't necessarily want something that's totally separate from like what I'm used to, I do want to be able to replicate some, like the kind of um, catharsis of like going from some dissonance to some consonance. You want to have some some sort of familiarity there. I don't want to like strand a listener completely in totally brand new intervals and like sounds they completely haven't heard before. Um, and when I say the listener, I mean myself as well. Um, right, right. You know, I, I, I want there to be something to hold on to. And I think 17 in particular um, is, is, is good at that. And that's one reason why I like it, I guess. Yeah, it's definitely really good at a lot of that stuff. Um, I was wondering, is your new album, is it, like, what's the theme of it? What is it about? Because I really like the good. theme of the other one that I, I listened to. Uh, Thank oh, you. Tessitura? A Transfiguration yeah. of Tessitura. A tessitura of transfiguration. Ah, backwards. Yes. Um, Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, I the the answer to that is I don't know yet. Um, the original idea of tessitura it was going to be um, a setting of texts from Kazimir Malevich, um, who is this twentieth century Russian avant garde painter, um, and he wrote this treatise called uh, "The World as Objectlessness," um, where he talks about um, art, um, kind of non-objective art, and art that doesn't depict something that doesn't, like, try to achieve 
that doesn't try to show some image through some like some lens you know he's the guy who painted the square um right and that was my idea and i i wrote a bunch of riffs i had a, a bunch of ideas um kind of like uh recorded and then i was listening to it and i was looking at the text and i thought this doesn't really fit um it doesn't really fit the idea so i thought like what what is the music that i've written i've like written these things i have some ideas down but i don't know what it means to me yet um and it kind of came to me um what the music was saying to me it was you know this is kind of trans narrative of like self-discovery and like self-realization and stuff um and then sort of i rewrote and reorganized the album to to fit that concept better um with this album once again i've written all this material i started off by thinking it was going to be a setting of some texts of um Klebnikov, who is this russian uh 20th century russian avant-garde poet um, but then I wrote all the songs without like looking at the text and I'm like, okay, well, it, it wouldn't feel honest to just like slap these poems onto these songs when they're not related. So Interesting. now I have to figure out what the album's about and I really, uh, I really don't know. I don't know yet. So I'll have to get back to you on it. If you, if you're thinking about a text while you're creating something, it influences the process much more than if you add it at the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, the influence, I think, goes as deep as like I read these poems um at the time that I, I titled the the little logic profiles that I had so all the songs are you know named after poems or quotations um so I don't know I would I do really want to set um some text to music which frees me of the artistic responsibility of having to come up with another text, to, you know, having to come up with some lyrics. Because that's hard. It's, it's hard to, to, to add words to music when I spend so many hours just having the music be independent of any, you know, any words or any verbal associations necessarily. What do you think about um, lyrics that are like nonsense syllables? Is that something you use in, in metal a bit, or is that uh, something you wouldn't even consider using? That is actually something that I really wanted to do on my second album. Um, so, once again, referencing early uh, 20th century Russian avant-garde. Um, what? There's something called, <laughs> something called Zaum, which is like trans-sense language. It's like, it's not exactly nonsense, but it like takes like aspects of words and kind of detaches them from their meaning and just kind of treats them in terms of their sound. So it, it kind of is this this sort of nonsense. Um, and I really wanted to use that um, in some of the, the compositions I had on that album. Um, I was afraid it might sound a little bit silly to kind of have nonsense. Again, if, you know, if it's screamed, no one's really gonna know. Right. Um, which is why I wrote my first album the lyrics in Polish because I didn't want anyone to know what I was saying because um, I <laughs> didn't really want to have to be saying anything. Yeah. Um, so that is certainly something I would um, I would do. Um, the closest I got to that is using like um, there's a segment of a song where I used a random number random number generator, um, a random word generator, and a random something else generator. And there's a part where I was just like saying these like just like random things yeah in like a random and stew yeah fun to use just like sound the sound of speech or the sound of voice devoid of like saying something necessarily that's something that i like about um metal vocals um it's 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 the sound and you know you are like saying something there is like a word kind of but it's more the texture of the word that matters than uh, the word itself necessarily. So cool. I'm so excited to hear what you, like that finished album, uh, the 17. Are you, do you have any plans to combine the 17 tone and 22 tone guitars in, in any music, like in a polysystemic way? Ooh, um, that's very interesting. I have never really thought about polysystemic music. Um, 
I know that the Mercury Tree has that one song where they use 17 and 23 at the same time. Yeah, um, yeah. Nuts. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Um, I think it'd be a lot to take in for the mind. I think polysystemic stuff is, is intriguing. I would want to kind of have a little bit of framework for what's going on, and I think mm -hmm. that um, would just take too much too much thought. Um, in the same way, I made a, um, I think J on, just intonation on guitar um, scares me for the same reason. Um, you know, you have this scale, but then as soon as you have strings of a, of, a, of a different frequency, of a different note, you have like a whole nother set of pitches. So then you have to consider like, you know, way, way, way more pitches than you originally had uh, on your scale. So I came up with the 17 tone um, just intonation scale a while back and I made a guitar and a banjo in it. Um, but then I didn't use it because it was too complicated. Um, the best I could do is kind of like play it by ear and kind of like listen for what I liked. But what I realized, I was just kind of tending towards stuff that sounded kind of 12-ish and familiar. Or, you know, like having like a drone on an open string and then just like kind of going up and down the scale on a string that was an octave or a fifth of the way. So it wasn't too far out of the system necessarily. Right. You know, I think but, there's a lot of people that really like that approach, the, the drone approach, and then using a scale. Like, I think that tends to be a really good, like, gentle introduction to, to Zen Harmonic yeah. scales sometimes. Worst Lords does that. Um, I realized the scale that I made is almost identical to the scale that Owen uses in Horse Lords. Um, oh, really? Yeah, um, and I ended up messaging him about his scale and, like, how he tunes his guitar because I realized they were very, very similar. Um, so I tried kind of approaching that guitar um, with, like, a horse lord um idea in mind, but I didn't get very far. I also, it was one of my earlier projects, and I did kind of a bad job on it. I would consider maybe doing another guitar in the same tuning. I also... I made that scale with the intention of trying to have the steps as similar in size as possible. So it was essentially just a kind of detuned version of 17 equal. Like 17 Neji, like what Amelia Huff says? I don't know if you've heard that term. Um, um, I haven't, but I did I did listen to um, the last episode that you had with her. Um, she is so cool. She is yes. on such another level in terms of thinking about oh my God, the yeah. sound and just like the the physical aspects of the sound. Um, yeah, she's she's so impressive. Um, yeah, yeah, to to make music with her sometime because I think I think we live in the same city. What's up with Portland just being like a hotbed of microtonalism right now? I know! <laughs> it's like, if I just hear about some random awesome person, it's like, oh, 60% chance they live in Portland. <laughs> Portland. That's, I mean, that makes it easier for me to potentially find um, other musicians who are willing to to learn microtonal, microt mic microtonal guitar. Um, My microtonal guitar. My microtonal guitar. <laughs> yeah. I think when it comes to like, microtonal know-how. I feel like I'm like leagues behind all the other people that have been um, on this podcast. I kind of, like when I first started getting into microtonal music, um, I was very, very interested into the th in the theory. And I think now I've kind of stepped away from the theory. I don't think about the theory. I've just like written these songs. They just happen to be on this guitar that has extra notes. It's, yeah. I'm not really even like thinking about that aspect of it. That's really cool, actually, because you're making music in a similar way that you would make music in 12. And, you know, it's really cool to think about all the different ways that if you have synharmonic music, people generally, people generally treat microtonal music differently than they treat music in 12. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one reason that I was really drawn to Jock Tears. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, um, I saw them play twice, or at least once. Um, and it's cool because you wouldn't know that it was microtonal. Like, if I didn't go into it, like, knowing that their guitars had extra notes, um, I probably wouldn't have noticed. Because um, they, don't, they don't make the kind of, like, um, the zenness, like, a central part of their music. They just use... Um, 17 to, to give like a little bit of extra edge 
um, yeah. the kind of punk stuff. Um, you know, it's these very simple progressions that only sound like slightly and like almost imperceptibly brighter. You know, the fifth being just like a little sharp, um, the thirds being like a bunch sharp. And that's that's a cool approach. I think something being like too microtonal from um, the start can kind of like alienate a listener um, who's not already used to hearing like more foreign sounding stuff. Um, that's why I think 17 is is cool because it's it's within that that range. You don't necessarily notice that it's that it's like microtonal. Right, right. Um, and same with Spencer's uh, stuff in, in 19, the kind of folksy stuff, it just sounds like a little bit extra sweet and a little bit extra pure, um, you know, because 19... Ugh. I... 19 is kind of the, the, the bigger tuning that I've just never played around with. I've never made a guitar in it. Um, I think I played a 19-tone guitar once um, at Kite's house, um, but that was it. Yeah. Oh, speaking of kite, I a while back I made two guitars in that in the in the tuning that kite came up with, um, and I have one that's just been I have a seven string in that in the kite tuning that's just been sitting in my basement and I have not played it. Um, Ooh, and I should because it was very cool. Um, the really pure um, intervals. One cool thing about that is that if you add a bunch of distortion, you don't kind of lose the, you know, because in, in 12, um, if you add too much distortion, you can hear fifths because they're very close to being in tune. But if you try and play a minor or major third, it sounds super muddy because it's pretty far from, uh, far from just. But right. if you play closer to just and add a bunch of distortion, that... Um, you know, you can still hear um, that interval and you don't get a bunch of mud. Um, and to that end, 17 has this cool thing where you can cross tune one string uh, to like 34. Um, yeah. And 34 yeah. has very, very close to pure uh, minor, and ma minor and major thirds. Um, I haven't written any songs with that, but I've like messed around with like playing some like heavily distorted, tremolo, picky, black metal sounding stuff in that cross string and it sounds so neat it sounds so neat because you can you can get this like major and minor thing that otherwise distorted sounds like really muddy but it's just it's very like crisp that's very fun yeah that's it's incredible um zatla uh declan did that on uh his uh microtonal uh funk album that used uh 17 to he had one song where he did that crack trick for 34. Ooh. Which is really cool. Who is that? He, um, he, I think he lives in, uh, I feel like he's ah. in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and he, like, he lives somewhere where it's, like, really nice outside, and so that's in his bio, and it's a little bit, like, sevish, I guess. Um, okay. Some of his okay. music. I'm always wondering how many different ways I can get tunings out of guitars, because, you know, I, I feel like that's not explored very much. Because people often refret a guitar to a different tuning, right? And then it's there. But then using the bridge trick that I, you know, appropriated into a YouTube video from Ivor Derig, um, uh -huh. <laughs> then it's like you can go minus one or minus two or even farther with a higher fret guitar. And then you can also do the cracks of all of those. So it's like if you've got like a 19 tone guitar, you could go down to from 19, 18, 17, 16 maybe. If, you, if, you, if you're willing to play in that constrained manner. When I finished that 22 EDO bass, um, mm, the yes. first thing I did was, was I covered the bass line from Gleam. a video on Twitter, right? Yeah, I think it was just like a, a small post I made. I feel like if I had known about that, 
uh, if I had had that information, I would have been like, hey, can I use you in the Gleam cover video? And then that'd be cool. Did like, you do a Gleam cover? Yeah, I, um, well, I did a big uh, Gleam cover that had like 20 versions of me. And well, actually it's it was 30. Um, oh, it's... wow, that's so awesome. When I was like first getting into microtunnel music in late 2017, um, I don't even, I don't really remember the circumstances surrounding it. I was, um, I just graduated college. I was unemployed. I was very anxious. I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, and sometime I just like started reading about, uh, microtonal music or like, I, I think Ben Johnson was like the first person I was like listening to. Um, and I remember making this post on Facebook no, it was Harry Parch. It was Harry Parch. Um, I made this post. I was like, "What if? What if I just got like really into microtonal music, like as a bit, like as my new joke? Like this is my new thing, microtonal music." Um, and then I did do that. I did exactly yes. that. That became my entire thing. Um, I just think it's so funny that I made that joke. Um, but when I was first getting into it, um, I just like looked up microtonal music on YouTube and. Um, your video on common misconceptions about microtonal music um, was one of the first videos that I saw. Um, <laughs> you have this bit where you say um, something like, if you want to get the full spectrum of emotion, then being a microtonalist is your only option. Um, yeah, and is. I, I, I <laughs> love saying that. I think it's so funny to say that being a microtonalist is your only option. Uh, yeah. It's true. <laughs> if, you, if you want the full range of expression, you, you got to get those extra notes. Yeah. That was like the, that was something that hit me when I started becoming microtonal. And then it was like, oh my God, I can't not do this. Like as like a person who likes to do sounds and like a composer, for me to not do this would just be insane. Yeah. Um, that said, like when I do go back to 12, just like playing on the, the, the keyboard or going back to one of my other guitars, it's, it like sounds like a little bit like wrong at first, but at the same time I can just like play any random notes and intervals and it just sounds fine. Like it's impossible to play a wrong note cause it's, it's all okay. There's no dissonance. It's all just fine. Right, I mean, just well. whatever they want that's, and it's fine. Yeah. Where in 17, I do feel like I have to pick a note that's kind of like right. Because, like, you, you know, it's it's interesting to hear something that's more, like, aleatoric or, like, the uses, like, tone rows or something. But, like, there is more of a sense of, like, oh, I do have to have the right note instead of just being, like, here's a chord, here's another chord, here's another chord. It all sounds fine. Yeah. You know, and I'm all really, really stuff. fascinated by people's sensitivity to, by people's sensitivity to wrong notes and, like, what they consider wrong notes. Because I think some people who are more sensitive if you go out of the diatonic scale and sort of violate their context of what they think is going to happen, they consider that wrong. But I think, wow. you know, people like you and me, a bit more into like contemporary stuff, um, not hearing any wolves in 12 uh, means that anything can lead to anything. Yeah, I think definitely having listened to a lot of contemporary classical and just like, you know, a lot of atonal music, there's nothing like surprising or jarring in 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 12 anymore um the beginning of tessitura i really wanted to be as like dissonant as possible uh, i was listening to a lot of bail of bar talk so i was like okay let's have a tone cluster let's have six six notes right next to each other semitones apart um Ooh. and so that's how it it, it it opens it opens with this really harsh dissonance which like over the course of the album expands to kind of more more and more consonants um and then ends on that same chord but like kind of recontextualized as this like um this like resolution almost i don't know that's the way i thought of it um but yeah even then like that um that dissonance doesn't feel like dissonant it just feels like here's just some notes in 12. Uh, <laughs> right a bunch of people have asked me um yourself included if tessitura was microtonal and i think a lot of people think it is but it's just the beginning at least it's just it's just very dissonant. It's just um, a lot of tone clusters. And I think probably my guitars were out of tune too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> or you know, what is out of tune? 
Fred, what even is that of tune anymore? Yeah. If we had grown up learning 17 and all of that, if we would still have the same feeling about, like, 17 having no wolves or, like, there being no wrong notes in 17, like, would we have to go higher? Or does it have to do something about the quality of intervals? I feel like 14 is a little bit like... 12 where at least i don't get any wolves out of it if the synthesizer isn't too harmonic sounding you know because like it doesn't have two tritones and if you have that that slightly sharper tritone it feels like a rub a bit because it is like encroaching on a wolf fifth and 17's got that i've never messed around in 14 um i've thought about it a tuning that i really I made a guitar and a bass in 15, and for a while, 15 was actually my favorite tuning. Um, ah, 15! 15 is great. Um, on guitar, I remember um, Iggs, Iglation? Maybe. Basin, Iggs? Yeah, um, yeah. That, like, uh, talked a lot about 15 and how uh, 15 was their favorite, like, tuning uh, on a guitar specifically, because you get you can tune in all kind of small forts and get the, the full two octaves. Um, and that just makes it easy because you don't think about, you just think about shapes. And that's what I think about. I think about shapes. I don't think about, is this a, a, a dominant? I don't know what a dominant is. Is it a subdominant? I don't know what that is either. Like um, at those same shapes, yeah. It's roughly analogous to um, the keyboards where you just have a block of black keys and then uh, the number of black keys plus one as your white key block. Like, because all the mm -hmm. positions are the same. But yeah, I let a friend of mine borrow that 15 guitar and I just haven't seen it in like a, two years. Um, so I'll eventually probably make another. It's a fun tuning. Um, it's definitely more micro, it's more zen than 17. You can't really stay within something more familiar as easily, except for, I guess, the, the 400 cent major third. Yeah. Um, and the minor sixth. Um, yeah, absolutely. Other than that, it's just like a, it's just an easy tuning as someone who gets overwhelmed when there's too many frets. 15, right. it's only three bars, so it's, it's not that far off. I wrote a handful of riffs in 15, like two years ago, and have not revisited them because I have not had those guitars. Um, <laughs> I guess I have the 15. Do I, I, I like lose track of how many guitars I have. I've sold a bunch, I've given some away, I've loaned some and not gotten them back. Um, I have more guitars than I know what to do with. Um, I mean, the at this point, like my main guitar is this Telecaster, you know, I built this neck by myself, um, which feels really cool. It, it definitely, I feel more connected to the instrument having like, carved out the neck myself and like placed those frets there originally rather than taking a, a different neck, taking off the fretboard and putting in the frets myself um, what, you know, in different places. So what's the big difference between making your own neck? Like how do you think it changes the quality of the instrument when you're, when you're playing or your connection to it? Um, I mean, I think with, with this, it's more like an emotional connection um, than with this, um, this is the first fretboard, this 17 guitar. Um, this is the first fretboard that I made from scratch. So I, you know, I, I like steamed the fretboard. I, I pried it off with like a paint scraper. Um, and I created, uh, I created this fretboard and it's, it's pretty messy, but it like, it works. Um, but you know, this neck is just like a, a neck that came from a factory. I have not that much of an emotional connection to it other than the fact that I've had this guitar for seven or eight years. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's more that I just like sculpted the actual like thing that I'm holding with my hands rather than just the fretboard itself. Um, but I've only done one neck from scratch, so it didn't come out perfect. Um, I'm not that skilled at it, and it took me a very long time. It's, it's really fast and easy for me to make a new fretboard. Um, I am trying to, uh, you know, compete with Ron Sword. Well, I'm, I'm not actually trying to compete with Ron Sword, but um, I think other than Ron Sword, I'm one of the only, um, like, 
luthiers. I mean, Ron, Ron sort of like an actual luthier. I'm just a, 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 a lady with a hammer. <laughs> and <somebody laughs> yeah. Um, one of the only people like making like microtonal instruments as like their main thing. So are you doing that like as generally like a hobby or do you charge for the guitars? Like you just kind of like make guitars and, and loan them out and they kind of free float around. Is that, is that the, is that the idea? I've made most of the guitars I've made, I've made for myself. I've done a handful of commissions, um, like five or six. Um, I was expecting to be doing a lot more, um, especially after that one tweet of mine got really popular. A bunch of people expressed interest, but then the only person who followed through was Adam. Well, there is someone else, but her guitar neck got lost in the mail, which is really unfortunate. Um, it's a big bummer. Yeah. Um, but no, I would like to be doing that more. It would give me something to do because I don't have a job. Um, and I don't feel like I can justify building more guitars for myself. Like I would rather just be doing it for someone else. Right. Yeah. Cause there's always that problem where if you've got microtonal guitars and you have to make microtonal music, it's so hard to do that. And like, even the most productive people who have microtonal guitars, like they always end up saying like, man, I really haven't used these microtonal guitars enough. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, this, um, I mean, the, the kite guitar that I have has been sitting in my basement for ages. It is also one of my first like fretboard attempts and I didn't do a great job. So it's kind of like fuzzy. One of the strings is broken. I did it on a, um, like a $40 seven string guitar that I got. Um, I think it could do a better job, but I also, that's also like a system that's a very cool, but requires so much more like brain power to be able to think about 41 notes and kind of the relationships between them than 17, where I can just like do what I would do in 12, but surprise doing this chromatic thing just makes it sound a little, a little different. Um, you know, it requires like actually thinking about like, here I'm, you know, this step is, is, is four, this step is three. You know, and that's where I kind of get lost in the, lost in the woods in 22. Cause like s start having to think a lot more and I don't, don't like thinking very much. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. So you want to play around a bit in 17? Um, since you've got that guitar there, and I have my, my keyboard here. 